together. Amen. You may be seated, church. The song says, I will be still and know you are God, but you're making so much noise. I don't know. I don't understand. I don't understand this. I don't understand this song. <laughs> it's a song that just speaks to our heart, I guess. It says, I will be still and know you are God. And uh, we just praise God this morning. A sense of worship, a sense of, what's the word I'm looking for? His presence has been here. That when you know that God is God, sometimes you can't be still but praise Him. It's about being still when everything else is stormy. It's about being still and knowing He's God when everything else around you doesn't seem to be in the right place. And so we come into that place this morning and say, Lord, let's hear from you. Lord, speak to me. So we want to welcome you for those who are visiting for the first time. A special welcome to you. We thank you for coming. We're in a series of getting to know you. And we're looking through the I am statements of Jesus. But today, we're going to break away a little bit and get to know the church that you're at. LBC, Linda's Baptist Church. What's Linda about? What's LBC about? What do we believe? What's our structures? What, what, what does Scripture say? And how should we operate within the life of the church? And so my title is Ministries in the Church. Ministries in the Church. There's a lot but we're going to narrow it down to four, the four pillars. Now, this sermon is a bit different. I'm going to give you a scripture reading. I'm going to break it down, but in every pillar, I'm going to give you added verses. So there's going to be a lot of Bible turning and a lot of Bible scrolling if you've got your apps. Are you up for the task? If you're not, Brother Mike on Monday or Tuesday, he puts the, the sermon on, online or... Um, on the website so you can actually see the points that I bring up on the PowerPoint. So turn with me to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 verse 42 to 47, Acts chapter 2 verse 42 to 47 and I will read. And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. 46 goes on to say, And day by day, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's our backdrop. That's our scripture reading for this morning. But I'm going to take you through the four pillars that our church, Linda's Baptist Church, have put in place as a foundation of what we feel is God's church. And it's based in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. But I will branch off as I go through the different pillars of the church. So, just a disclaimer. Prayer is the concrete under each pillar. Prayer is part of each pillar. So I'm not going to preach a lot about prayer, but it's intertwined and it's together in every single ministry. So if I'm talking about the ministry of worship or the ministry of preaching, know that prayer is paramount in each of those pillars. Okay, we're good. That's just the disclaimer. Verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That is the ministry of edification. Go check our website. When you go on there, there's four categories. One is edification, one is worship, one is evangelism, and one is uh, engaging in the community. So I'm going to go through each one. For, verse 42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And that is the ministry of edification. We are all believers in Christ and are subject to learners of God's word. Some of you might think, oh, I want to just come and praise and worship. We've got to get God's word in as well. This is where the learning happens. God's word. So we don't just teach anything that comes out from the Bible, but we've got to study 
We can't just pick up a Bible verse and say, oh yeah, it is, this is what God says. No, we take, take, take it with, with respect and understanding. We need to study the scriptures. We need to research the scriptures. Spend time in it so that I can be better equipped, so that you may be better equipped, and that we may be better equipped in understanding what God's word says. God's word is important, church. It helps us to grow, and I want you to grow. But for you to grow, you need to be able to stand on your own feet and be able to stand on God's word for your own lives, in your own situation, and your own circumstances. So you need to know how to also interpret God's word, making it alive in your life. See, God's word is not just a, something written in a book. It's alive. It comes to life. It comes to life. And when you hear God's word read out, it's the voice of God speaking into your life. How can you know God if you don't know his word? You want to hear from God? Be still, but read his word. And you can hear what he's saying to you. And the voice becomes more clearer. See, Acts chapter 20. Now, here I go with the Bible verses. You've got to be quick. Acts chapter 20 verse 32 says, And now I commend you to God and to the... Come, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm pausing like that, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for some, for some excitement. I want you to fill in the blank there. Let's try that again. And now I commend you to God and to the... Of His grace, which is able to? You see how that goes in tandem? The word and building. And to give you, I love this word, and to give you an? Among all those who are sanctified. Just imagine that. From just those few verses, what do we see there? God's word is important for you to grow. For you to be built up. To you, for you to be established. See, when you're a house built of proper concrete, you can't be shaken very easily. When you know God's word properly, you can't be shaken by every that and this that people tell you. Because you know how to rightly divide God's word. It builds you up. It sets you apart. But look at the blessing that's also in there. It gives you an inheritance. Isn't that beautiful? God's word gives you a reward as well. Just imagine that. So Jesus, as we get into know Jesus, what is Jesus? Jesus is the Word. One, uh, John 1 verse 1, I think it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He is the very Word of God. So when we look at Jesus, when we identify with Jesus, when we learn about Jesus, we know that He is the Word. 2 Timothy verse 3 Sorry, 2 Tim Timothy 3, 13 to 17. Let me have some water. Try that again. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13 to 7 says, While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. And I like this word. Every time it's popping up in the Bible, I get more excited. Knowing. Getting to know. So we got to know. Knowing from whom you learnt it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred scriptures or the sacred writings. Which are able to make you wise for salvation. Through faith in Christ Jesus. It's not to make me wise. I can learn as much as I want, but it's no benefit if you are not getting wiser. I need to teach you and you need to learn as well so that you may be wiser in understanding the scriptures unto salvation. Verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So I need this word of God to help me. How much more do you need the word of God to help you? So sharing, preaching God's word has to take priority. Because people so often get deceived and sidetracked, like verse 13 says, because we don't fully, truly understand God's word. 
So we've got to commit ourselves, church, to the learning and the preaching and the hearing of God's spoken word. Amen? That's why in our church service, there's a time allocated for preaching. Open up scripture, we read, and we preach. Mark 13 verse 31 says, Heaven and earth will pass away. You and I will die. But my... Will not... How is that possible? God's word is eternal. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word. Do you see the significance of his word? You know those memory verses you learned in Sunday school? Those are promises and life-giving verses that we have to hold on to till eternity. God's word is important, church. Don't ever be fooled. Ah, no, you don't need to read the Bible every day, or you don't need to know this, you don't need to know that. God's word is powerful, and you need to know it. It's not just about coming and singing and dancing and showing off with those moves. <laughs> eh? <laughs> I'm learning, I'm learning. I've been, I've been practicing at home, every. It's not about that. It's about learning God's word. That's important. So when you see us doing these moves... You know, it, it's grounded in God's word. We can talk about how David danced. It's biblical, eh? You're dancing, eh? You're not supposed to be dancing, pastor. What's wrong with you? Don't you know the Bible says you're not supposed to be dancing? Hey, buddy, show me where it says I should not be dancing in the house of the Lord. You see? You've got to know your word. Did I embarrass myself? I did. Eh? It was, was, was the move bad? Echoes laughing at me. Verse 46 to verse 47 in Acts chapter 2. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. And verse 47 goes on to say, praising God and having favor with all people. So let's look at worship in LBC. Day by day, they're atten attending the temple. So you're coming in every Sunday. We break bread, communion. We get together and we praise God, verse 47. And having favor with all the people. So let's look at worship. 1 Chronicles 16 to 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. When I'm looking at this word, all the earth, I'm looking at the pine trees that we saw yesterday now. It's giving me a new perspective now. All the earth, everything gives God praise. I'm going to show off and hope, Uncle Johan, you listen to this back. Pinus rocardus and Pinus canarius and the cedars from Lebanon and the cedars from Himalayas. They give God praise. In their function and in their worth. Sing to the Lord all the earth. You too sing to the Lord. Tell of his salvation day to day. Worship can be such a controversial topic. Worship can be such a place of division. But the problem is, we're not talking about praise and worship here. That's where the problem is sometimes end up. The division, the controversies, is what happens here. But worship is something deeper. And I'm going to get to that. Because I first need to say that I think, this is just my humble opinion, you know, not because I was part of the worship team or, or anything like that. But I think, I humbly think, here at LBC, we've got a good balance of worship. We've got a good balance of singing, of praising, of trying to put in some old school songs. You know, some of us who are from the older times, remember hymnals. You remember the red book? You remember page numbers? Turn to page 389 and sing with us. You remember those hymns and the four stanzas and the five? So worship sometimes needs a balance. And I think we've got that right. I know the, the council was telling you, Uncle Frati must introduce a few more hymns. Because what happens is when you grew or grow up Listening to a few songs, it takes you to a place. That song took you to a place. It, it, you reminisce in worship. Oh, how good God was in that moment of my life. And I sang, how great thou art. For great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. Those songs of hymns. And so, when we get older, we sit in the church. And yes, there's contemporary music. And I always tell the young people, you too are going to get old. And those songs you thought was hip now, you're going to be complaining about the new worship pastor back then. So respect the congregation. 
understand as elderly, I understand as young people and bring in a nice mix of song. And I think we've got that uh, quite well understood here. And, and I know France was telling me um, that he's got so much plans for the worship team that he's that God has given him a vision of what it is that he wants to do in the church. And I'm so excited that me and France, we're going to sit and we're going to discuss and see how we can take worship even higher, 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 eh? Lift Jesus higher. But we as Christians, this is where I'm going to get to now, get sidetracked with what worship really is about. Look at Genesis 22 verse 5. Genesis chapter 22 verse 5 says, and look out for the word worship, right? Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and will go over there and worship and come again to you. Anybody familiar with the story of Abraham and Isaac? He never go over there to go sing songs. <laughs> you never go up the mountain to go and sing, be still and know. You never go there to sing a song or have a dance and listen to the beautiful drum singing. He went there to sacrifice his son. And he said, you guys stay here while I go and worship. Worship is a sacrifice. Gone quiet now. You like the singing, you like the dancing, but that ain't worship. In its entirety. That's just a small part. Worship is a place of sacrifice. So let me give you a New Testament scripture. Romans 12 verse 1. I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. Which is your spiritual worship. You get the picture of worship? Gone quiet because it's a living sacrifice. Day to day is worship. Sorry? Favorite verse. That's what it is about because her late dad knew what worship was. That it wasn't just a Sunday morning, 10 to half past 10. It's an everyday life sacrificing myself in worship to God. Lord, did I please you today? Lord, did I do the right thing today? Lord, am I being what you want me to be? Am I putting aside the desires of the flesh and showing you, Lord, I want to worship you? Worship is laying down your life and sacrificing yourself to a greater being and saying, Lord, you are worthy. I want to worship you. And how we do that is by the way we live. Sacrifice is a form of worship. And so we give our bodies as a living sacrifice to spiritual worship. What does Jesus say about worship? Jesus said, go to LBC at 10 o'clock and go and praise and worship. Sing songs when February says stand up and sing. Sing songs when Franz says sing. Sit down when Echo says sit down. Stand up when they say stand up. Did Jesus say that? What did he say? He says, Worship in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4 verse 23 to 24. He is speaking to the Samaritan woman. He gave a Samaritan woman the key to worship. No, we worship at this mountain and that mountain. Jesus says, no, there is an hour and there is a time that is coming where true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. That's where we worship God. You see, uh, William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he spoke these words in 1940, I think. Yeah. To worship is to quicken the conscience by God's holiness. It's to feed the mind with the truth of God. It's to purge the imagination by the beauty of God. It's to open up the heart to the love of God. And it's to devote the will to the purpose of God. Isn't that a beautiful definition of worship? It's not hymn 155. It's not psalm this. 
It's not that song. It's about quickening the conscience to God's holiness, feeding the mind of truth to God, purging our imagination to the beauty of God and to open up our heart to the love of God and the will to the purpose of God. Let's move on. I can see that time is taking away. Verse 43. And awe came upon every soul. This is in Acts chapter 2. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Verse 7, the latter part of it says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The third pillar, not in any particular order, but the third pillar in the church is the ministry of evangelism. Matthew 28 verse 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So one of the church's duties and the church's pillars is to evangelize. So we got the word, we got worship, nice Sunday morning, beautiful. But we need to also evangelize here at LBC. And so this can be a very challenging task. This can be a very demanding task. But I think here at LBC, we've always been creative in this area. We've, you know, we've always tried different avenues and different ways of being creative, of trying to rely on the Holy Spirit for, Lord, you guide us in this evangelism process. You see, we had foot soldiers back way back then that used to go door to door with Pastor Lindu and uh, Kevin Daly. And then it moved on from them to uh, Akona and uh, Uncle Bob used to go with their challenge newspapers from door to door and just going from area to area. And now we've got our soup kitchen, which we've recently started once a month, which Kevin and Godfrey used to start and, and Kevin's taken over and continuing in, in a form of evangelism, reaching out. And then we've got the prayer walks like the ladies went yesterday. We've got different forms of evangelism. There's no one way of doing it. There's many ways. But we've got to do it. And we've got to participate in evangelism in some form. So I think we're moving a bit slow maybe on the foot soldiers type, uh, side of things. <laughs> and I speak this uh, from a church point of view. But we are steady. We are steady in the path in terms of evangelism. That through it we are still trusting in God in this area. And we have learned that we have to do it in accordance to the scripture which is in Acts 1 verse 8, that says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We do evangelism by this work of the Holy Spirit. We have to have the Holy Spirit in us and with us to reach those in our area, in our community. This is the only way we can do outreach. The only way we can do evangelism. Otherwise, we're just doing it as an event or as a ministry for the sake of doing it. We need the power of the Holy Spirit with us every time we go and do evangelism. Jesus has given us the command to give us the Holy Spirit that has the power to accomplish the task. And that's how we're doing it. So I think evangelism is a strong play within our church. And I think we've made a small footprint in the social media side of things. You know, we're always thinking evangelism, door-to-door, -door, newspapers, and talking to people, which is good, and we need to still do that. But there's another area that we've been just recently been tapping into and growing, and I feel we made a small footprint in terms of the social media side of things. From Facebook to YouTube and our church website as well, that can be so easily touched upon. You can just go on your phone and you get in touch with what the church is about. You can find out where the church is. In fact, I found a young man that sit, well, used to sit right there and I greeted him one morning and I said, what's your name? He says, my name is Jabulani and uh, he stays in the area. I said, hey, uh, nice to meet you. And uh, how did you know about the church? No, I watched a sermon online. And so he came. You see, there's a social media form of evangelism. Many people have told me that they've come because they Googled a church nearby. They, you know, they were moved in the community. Hey, what church is nearby? And so they go on their phones and they check, oh, Linda's Baptist. That looks nice. That looks... So they come. So social media is a form of evangelism here at the church. And we're trying to grow that and see how God is going to use it. But we prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit to guide us 
in this avenue of evangelism that we can reach those who are in need of salvation and give them the power of the Holy Spirit so that they may have peace, that they may have joy, and they may have love when they come into the sanctuary. So God has given us, given us the spirit of power to minister and to bring those of you into the sanctuary. So if you're a visitor this morning, know that you were here for the right reason, that God wanted you to be here. And God has a plan for you to be a part of the sanctuary. It was not by accident. It was by divine order that you were here to visit and to hopefully find this to be a home of spiritual growth. So with that said, let me move on to my fourth and final pillar, which is the ministry of engaging our community. Engaging our community. This is the fourth pillar, and verse 44 in Acts chapter 2 says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. Verse 45 goes on to say, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. The ministry of engaging our community. This is a tough one, but it's an important one for the church to keep and to participate in and to be actively involved in. How do we do it? Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 9 to 21. There's many ways, but we need to be grounded by God's word and hear what he has to tell us how we do in engaging ministries and our community. Listen to this. You there? There you go. It's on the screen. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. We need to abhor what is evil. Eh? Too, too many times we're compromising on that side. We need to abhor what is evil. But let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. See, not even the Proverbs only talk about slothful. Even the New Testament. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Hey, hey, hey. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Don't think you're too high that you can't associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. So that first thought of trying to hook somebody when you get angry. <laughs> no, no, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta pause. You gotta humble yourself. Take it and say, Lord, vengeance is yours. That's the most hard thing to do sometimes. You just want to, hey, kick this, hey, this fellow. They, they cut you in front of, uh, you know, on the road. They just cut you. Man, what is wrong with you? No, hey, Lord, your vengeance is yours. Help me to hold my tongue here. Yeah? Not because these taxi drivers, they're just cutting me off and hitting me from the back. And all of these things. Vengeance is the Lord. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay, says the Lord. Oh, verse 20. I don't want to read verse 20. Help me read verse 20. To the contrary, if your enemy, if your enemy is hungry, you said it. I, I never said it. You, you, <laughs> if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, oh man, look at this. You know, you leave them absolutely bamboozled. You leave them so perplexed. I just hurt that guy's feelings. I just said that about that person. I just ridiculed them. And they still love me. They still gave me water. They still fed me. They still took care of me. 
In doing so, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's how we as a church engage in the community. Amen? We engage by this passage of scripture, Romans 12, verse 9 to 21, by loving. Let it be genuine. A boy in what is evil, but we've got to do the right thing. I read this and I say, man, this was so hard a scripture to, to fulfill. But the church has to be committed. And here at LBC, we are committed in trying our level best in serving diligently and faithfully in engaging with the community. And I feel deep within my heart that our community needs the Lord. And we as a church have to show them the way forward. We have to show them that there is a different way of going about business in and around our community. So we have to show them the way forward. Now we've tried different methods in the past, but you know, you know we tried this ministry and we tried this and we tried that. And, but a lot of times we lack in resources and sometimes people aren't available to us to actually use them to engage in the community. And so we're very thankful for Godfrey when he came up with the idea with, along with Kevin and them to let's do the soup kitchen. And I know Uncle K and them also joined with Tsetso and a few others. If I'm missing your name, I apologize. But we are just looking for different ways that we can engage with the community. Now we've got Susan saying, hey, let's go to the hospital on the 16th of May, I think. Or what's the date? 18th May. Well, oh, that's my birthday. I forgot. <laughs> we go into the hospital ministry and we're taking things to engage with the community. Touching base with the police. Engaging in their walks and bringing our community together. So we need to touch base in these areas and see how we can be um, influential and being part of what God has called us to be in engaging in our community. You see, we have to pray in this vein because what does God say? That the workers are few, but the harvest is ready. We want to build relationships with the community and our community workers, but we also want to abhor evil and bring down those strongholds, like number two down the road there. You know, I say it all the time. I don't know if they see me, they're going to catch me one day. Maybe they, <laughs> The day that place comes tumbling down, oh, they're going to be angry. They, yeah, they heard that pastor saying, you know, y'all heard. You know why y'all, this went, business went broke? Because that pastor was praying that y'all. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in trouble. But you know what, I don't care. Because yesterday, driving past, I saw, saw, I saw so much of beer bottles just smashed on the ground and lying on the side of the street. Like, how do we build a community with places like this? All it does is got these drunkards walking up and down, breaking homes, breaking lives. You are damaging community, damaging lives and families. So they can sit with a profit in their pocket while lives are being damaged. And those same lives will come over and over begging for two rand, begging for five rand so they can have a court. So they can have their fix. How do we reach out? We need to abhor what is evil. But we need to also engage with the community and try our level best of showing them love. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14. You can see I get very upset with that, that place down there. I see they repainted the wall too as well. They're trying to trick me. I know it's still what it is. Hey, when that place comes tumbling down, you're going to thank God and we're going to praise you. We're going to praise God. Amen? Amen. That needs to come down, church. I'm telling you, it's damaging households. And if something happens to me, you'll know it's probably from there. <laughs> they put a hit on me. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 14 says, And we urge you, brothers... Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. We've got to exercise patience with them all. I know I get very frustrated sometimes. I also have to apologize when I get a bit frustrated. But we have to exert patience with all of those that we are trying to build up. And sometimes engaging with the community means that we need to be patient with them to build them up. So church, that's basically the four pillars of our church here at LBC. I hope I presented it in a good way. This is the space we first need to attend, these four pillars. Before, I know a lot of people have a lot of ideas of adding a fifth and a sixth pillar and a this and a that. 
But let's work on these four. Let's grow them. Put people in the right place with the right gifts in those avenues and in those pillars so that we can build the church up. And then we can, out of the overflow, do other ministries and actually be able to bring those drunkard guys, those guys with messed up minds, into a place of healing. See, at the moment, we can't do that. We don't have the resources for counseling and so on and so forth. So maybe that's the reason why God is not bringing it down just yet. Maybe he's saying, you as a church, function in these four pillars, build it up, strategically organize yourself, structure yourself, so that when the time comes that I'll pour out my wrath upon them, the church is ready to receive and to bless and to change and to transform lives. I can't give you something and then not be able to journey with you. I can't give you salvation that comes from Jesus Christ and then not be able to show you scriptures of how it is you're supposed to walk in this path. You see, we as a church, your church, my church, our church, we have a role to play and a part to play in the body of Christ. So 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of one spirit. Verse 14 says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Now you've got to listen to this very carefully. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, would not make sense if it is less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in one body, each one of them as he chose. If we are all a single member, where would be the body? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So the four pillars speak of edification. I'm preaching here, pastor preaches here, we get a few guest preachers, but that's not only the place of edification. There's a Wednesday night youth Bible study. There's a Sunday morning discipleship class that Uncle Steady runs. A uh, beginner's class, sorry. Tuesday is the discipleship class. There's life groups and connect groups that you can engage in on a Wednesday and a Thursday. There's the weekly Sunday school and youth meeting. There's the monthly men's and women's ministry. All are forms of edification. All are forms of evangelism and engaging with our community. We've got the engagement with the soup kitchen that's on Saturday. And then you've got the 18th of May for the hospital ministry, engaging with the community. You get it? We're doing all of this, which combines in, in growing the body of Christ. So we've got to be part of all of these things, church, because we are part of the body of Christ. If I have to preach... If I have to do this, if I have to do every single thing, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because my giftings is not such. I can't expect February to be singing here, to be preaching, then to be doing evangelism. I pick on you a lot, my boy. I'm so sorry. To do everything and then we just sit there and say, but why is evangelism not working? Why is, it? Why is that? Oh, speak to the pastor. The pastor can't do everything. Four pillars, we need to get involved in each of them. Work in our strengths. The body is vast and it's got many parts to it. And we each need to find what are we? Are we a hand? Are we a foot? Are we an eye? Do we see things? Do we hear things? What are we as part of the body of Christ? You see, our vision is always about leading people to Christ by following Christ, our leader. And I'm going to end by saying John 20 verse 21 says, and this is on the website, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We all have a part to play in our church. If you love this church, if you care about this church, then be a part of this church. Whatever you're doing at home, know that there is a church that is part of you and that you need to serve it. You know, the, the easiest thing to do at a church is to give your money. That's the easiest thing to do. So I challenge you, maybe don't even give your money. Come and serve. <laughs> You'd rather take out that money and give it, eh? Because it's so much easier 
than waking up on a Sunday morning to prepare for, you know, your guys have rehearsals, to come on a Thursday, prepare, or to go early morning Saturday, prepare the soup and go out onto the streets. It's harder to do that than to get on your phone, hey, I'll be, go on to the banking app and put in some money there. It's easier to do that than to actually serve. But if this is your church, you found it as a home, let's build it, let's grow it, and let's see Jesus being glorified in this community. And let's see this church as a light in a dark place, being salt, feeding people, encouraging them, seeing how they grow and walk with them along life's narrow way because God is good and he cares for you. And he wants you to be part of his kingdom. And when you're part of his kingdom, you cannot be shaken. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. God bless you. And uh, with that note, I'll call on the worship team. And uh, I don't see Sister Susan here. Oh, she's there at the back. Uh, Susan, just to give an announcement, I think you wanted to share something. And so this is in line with our ministries.